Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Glob Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, which sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Adam Riggs, the CEO of Framable. I will talk about what the company is, but before we get into that, Adam, tell me a little bit about how you see the evolution of collaboration having proceeded from the beginning of the pandemic to this point, and then how you see it proceeding going forward in terms of collaboration in remote spaces. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's happy to be, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I think uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, collaboration was, um, you know, it was something that, you know, it was, there was an emergency and everyone had a lot of new problems to solve. And mm -hmm. I think that collaboration in that, in that time started with, um, let's continue to do the things that we know how to do. Let's rely on the tools that we're already familiar with while we start to solve this new and growing set of problems that are specifically related to this moment. So what I mean by that is uh, people had video, you know, video meeting software mm -hmm. in and around their workflow, you know, in their company, they relied on that. People had shared documents, uh, shared document programs and uh, possibly whiteboarding program uh, around, and they relied on those. Um, so they were not necessarily uh, looking to upgrade these tools to better tools because they had so many new problems. They really just, I think, wanted to uh, focus on the new problems and all of the existing tooling that they were somewhat familiar with that they might have relied on uh, in a much lighter weight way. They just consider that considered that their new tool set to rely on so that they could focus on the new stuff. Um, as the pandemic has gone on and we've all been reading the papers, you know, um, a lot of new dynamics are in play. Um, people are tired of working um, in isolation. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the most difficult things about working remotely for, for many people is that it feels somewhat isolating. Sure. Um, you don't see your colleagues, uh, in person, obviously, you don't see them remotely uh, through the video screen unless you're working, uh, you know, in a meeting together or in a pairing session together. So it it does feel um, lonely sometimes. It feels you feel disconnected uh, from the larger organization. You don't mm -hmm. have as many uh, or any opportunities to bump into people the way you would in a physical office. So I think that the tools that that we started with in 2020. Um, they did a good job of uh, helping us get through a difficult period. And for, for most people, it was an, a, a totally new set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, um, and up until this point, you know, that we're at, that we are now, we really find ourselves um, frustrated with some of the byproducts of those tools or some of the emergent properties of, of what it means, you know, what it's like to work uh, every day with those tools as the primary tools. And now I think people are focused on um, trying to, you know, find a better path. And for yeah. some people, the better path means um, a hybrid strategy now that that's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm going to go to work a few days a week now that that's possible, and then I'm going to have some, you know, some deep work opportunities at home, maybe a few meetings at home, but, you know, for the most part, uh, I'll be able to divide my week that way. I think that's one approach. Um, another approach is to is to to try and find tools that just do a better job in some of mm -hmm. these ways than the ones that we started with. That makes a lot of sense, and I help 21 companies transition to hybrid and remote work and kind of figuring out their future. And what I find is that the most important thing that people really don't like to do is go to the office and do the same old things that they were doing at home because they're going through the pain of the commute. That's an hour there, an hour back, you know, putting on fancy clothing, uncomfortable clothing, having a set desk lunch, having unhealthy snacks. So there's a lot of problems with going to the office, especially if you end up doing the same things. So what I work on with my clients to do is to try to do as many things at home as possible and then come to the office only for more intense collaborative things and or social bonding. So it usually ends up being no more than a day a week. That's the yeah. kind of two usual rate of for what my clients find comfortable. And so I'm curious what you've seen 
in your work with companies with trying to minimize the amount of time in the office by trying to do things that can be done at home at home. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the, the universe of things that can be done well uh, and consistently well uh, at home is, is growing. I mean, mm -hmm. as people get more comfortable working from home and as um, as the tools that support remote work get get more, you know, become more robust and and um, and satisfying to use, I think it, you know, it's true that you know the the number of things that you can do well from home is growing mm -hmm. uh, compared to the way it was in you know say April or May, uh, twenty twenty. And so tell us a little bit more about what your company does to help these tools. So I know that's kind of the space that you're in. Share sure. a little bit more about the, your background and your sure. company. Of course. So Frameable is a uh, uh, Frameable is a new company started in um, in late 2020, early 2021, um, and our focus is on video enabled or video forward. But I'm not saying video required. Uh, video forward tools that um, that really support natural interactions, uh, you know, online. Um, the software is delivered in the browser. There are no downloads. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the way the product started off um, was it was an event product. So everybody had video software to have meetings in, like we are doing right now. But uh, one thing that was missing was uh, a, a more fun, uh, a, a lighter weight, uh, sort of nicer to look at, better aesthetics, uh, meeting opportunity for social events, right? Mm -hmm. So we built a product called Social Hour uh, that started off as just a mingling, a, a piece of software that made it really easy to move around from group to group uh, and mingle in a lightweight way. And that has evolved into a full-blown event product mm -hmm. with a stage layout and a sort of a hybrid layout, which combines stages with rooms. Um, uh, so we now have a full-blown virtual event software product, which is called Frameable Events. And what we found ourselves doing during the pandemic was intentionally uh, misusing or appropriating our own software, but instead of having it, instead of using it um, uh, like event software, like the event software it was mm -hmm. designed to, um, to, to be, we, because an event has a beginning and an end and it has a run of show or an agenda of some kind. I mean, that, that defines an event. Whereas, um, whereas uh, in a virtual office product um, needs to be always available. So persistent mm -hmm. virtual space. So we started using our own event product, uh, but instead of um, using it just for an hour at a time or something like that, like for happy hours, for example, the way many of our clients did, we started setting the beginning time of the event as the morning and the end time of the event as the end of the day. And mm -hmm. basically we spent all day in the software um, because that made it a lot, that was a lot more pleasant than moving between, uh, you know, video meetings that were mm. totally discreet. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. uh, does, I would wonder, does that make people feel always on? Is that a, a challenge? Or tell me a little bit more about it. I would wonder if yeah. I, I can yeah. imagine that it can make some people feel that way. Yeah. So, um, so the answer is, I mean, my preamble to the answer is that it's a perfectly legitimate uh, question or like soft objection. And we hear it sometimes uh, from clients who have the same concern. And the response is that it would be uncomfortable if the if the people using the software didn't have quite a lot of uh, choice about how much information they shared. So mm. in other words, you know, you don't have to work with your camera on if you don't want to. You don't have to make yourself available, you know, to be interrupted if you don't want to. But what's really um, powerful about our software is that we give the user the ability to transmit what they're doing, to <laughs> transmit whether or not they're open to being interrupted or not. Mm, okay. Of course, the, the user gets to decide if their camera is on or not. So you you can use our software and have it be uh, completely a private experience where. Uh, your colleagues can see that you're in the office, 
but they 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 also see that you're not available to them. And that's very similar to what it's like to work in a physical office. I mean, when you go to a physical office, um, you you don't have the choice of being invisible, really. I mean, sure. you know, you walk in, people see you walk in, they see you get coffee, they see, uh, you know, with some exceptions, they, you know, certain kinds of offices know, but for the most part, uh, they can see through windows and glass mm -hmm. walls, maybe who you're with and things like that. And this actually serves a purpose, a very important positive, um, has a very important positive effect on um, the colleagues in the office because, hmm. uh, you know, as humans, we take in a lot of information through our eyes. So having that uh, contextual vector, that per that uh, peripheral vision, mm -hmm. giving me information about what Gleb is doing today and what John is doing today, uh, you know, or are they in or not in and who have they been working with and things like that. I mean, even this level of information helps build trust on teams. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why people uh, have have missed the office. Is It's, it's mm -hmm. not because they miss the commute, obviously, as you sure. pointed out. It's because it's very natural for us to use the information that we're taking in uh, peripherally in our decision making. Mm -hmm. So to not take in any of that information, which is you know what happens when you're working from home, like you are and like I am under, for most people when you're working from home, you're only interacting with and you're only getting information from the people that are on your schedule. Right. And that's not that's not normal. Um, I mean, it's normal to have a busy schedule, but it's not normal for there to be zero information about what any of the other people on your team are doing, unless they're on your schedule. So what we've done is we've said, an an office environment is a lot like an event. An office environment is not a meeting where it's just you and the person you're meeting with, or I'm working alone. An office environment is a space that supports a wide variety of interaction types. Mm -hmm. uh, events that were scheduled a long time ago, uh, sorry, meetings that were scheduled a long time ago, meetings that were scheduled yesterday, uh, collisions where you bump into someone in the hallway or uh, getting a coffee. I mean, there's so many different kinds of interactions mm -hmm. that are supported by a physical office that are not supported just by meeting software. So what our software does is it makes it possible for someone who's working remotely to experience that full spectrum. Okay, that's interesting. One of the techniques I teach my clients to do is called virtual co-working, where everyone signs into, let's say, a Zoom or a Microsoft Teams call and they can leave their camera on and off, but they turn their microphones off and they leave their speakers on. And then they mm -hmm. work on their individual projects. So they start by sharing what they're going to be working on. And then they work yeah. on their individual projects. But if they have a question, they can turn on the microphone and ask. And then they yeah. can discuss, problem solve, whatever. It's especially helpful for junior team members. But it's helpful for everyone. Because at the end of the time, they all turn on their cameras and microphones and say what they did. And so it's kind yeah. of a mutual bonding experience, a collaborative experience. And so there's some similarities to what you're saying. One of the things that I hear from clients is that they do feel a little, little bit more drained in that experience than they would mm. if they were working solely alone. So, yeah. I'm and there's the question of you know the typical phrase of Zoom burnout. So I'm curious yeah. if you're getting a little bit of, of that burnout because of that feeling of being connected. What are your clients saying about that? Yeah. So I I would um, hypothesize that the reason why people first of all what you described is knowing that that people were trying things like what you described was mm -hmm. part of what validated for us that there would be that th that this product would be well received mm -hmm. because you you have people who are you know basically hacking together something that doesn't really exist as a fully formed product yeah. because they want or need or would benefit from in, you know, in the eyes of their colleagues or boss, more connectivity. So mm -hmm. the, the fact that people were trying to do it the way you describe is very, is very encouraging to us. Now, I think, I think the reason why, if I was going to hypothesize uh, as to why people had that reaction to what you suggested, my, my hypothesis would turn on, again, what you described was not visual. 
Mm -hmm. And so people know that they're connected. And in the case of, of um, your example, the, it sounds like the audio was on, so you could sort of hear you know, things. Uh, if somebody wanted to come in and talk to you, it would be like somewhat surprising to you because you have no visual cues. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can walk through, you can walk through the world and, and hear very little that's actionable. But what you see is always is always going to help you form, you know, a better contextual, better peripheral understanding hmm. of your environment. It's always actionable. Even if the right thing to do is take no action, it's still information. That's why, hmm. you know, the science says that when you drive a car, uh, you make something like 60 decisions per minute, they say, uh, to, to keep the car safe. I mean, the speed is fine. The speed is, you know, fine before another car enters my field of vision. But as soon as another car enters my field of vision, I have to think about slowing down. So mm -hmm. I think that the difference between what we're, what our software achieves and, and what you described that's achievable, you know, with the existing tools is that we really focus on the visual, uh, on the visual input and mm -hmm. the microphone can be off and the camera can be off, but by sharing what you're working on, and sharing it in a way that your colleagues can actually see it, mm -hmm. they absorb it in an effortless way. And it, it is, it does contribute to their, you know, it contributes to the esprit de corps and the sense of trust mm -hmm. that, that is built with your colleagues when you see them and you know that even though you're not working with them directly, they're there and you're there and you're working on the same, toward the same big goals even mm -hmm. though you're not working together at that moment. You're still on the same team, working toward the same big set of goals. Um, that's the difference. Okay, and I can see how that would be especially helpful for all remote uh, companies. Now, yeah. all remote teams. How do you integrate hybrid work, meaning sometime in the office, sometime at home with the Frameable tool? Like, What kind yeah. of things do you do on Frameable? What kind of things do you do at home? Yeah. So um, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, so so our company is is totally remote, mm -hmm. but but you don't have to be 100% remote to use our our products. One of the ways that um, that people uh, use our products to support a hybrid work experience is that if they have a certain location or a certain name for a certain floor of their building or a name for a certain you know. Uh, project room or conference room, they can create a corollary virtual version of those things. So if you have a conference room called Market Street Conference Room, right, after the street in San Francisco, uh, then you could have people in person going to the Market Street Conference Room that day to work on something. And you could also have in our space a Market Street Conference Room uh, in our software. So people who are in the, the physical office uh, could be visible inside that same conference room okay. that you, you know, that people at home are in. So the people at home would would again have this reinforced feeling that they are they are present in the space where the work is getting done. It's just some people are in the physical space. Uh, with a virtual um, footprint, and other people are just in the virtual space, but they can be named the same thing. They can have the same colors. You know, you, you can do something to the design of the room that mimics the design of the physical room. So there are things you can do to sort of tie it all together. Okay, and as you know well, there are a number of competitors coming out with, let's say, Google Hologram and you know the meta virtual mm -hmm. the, the the virtual reality augmented reality mm -hmm. what do you think will be the future in terms of how people collaborate in these virtual spaces because they are competing with what you are trying to offer so what yeah. are the distinct benefits of what you offer versus what they offer yeah so um that's an easy question that i love to answer the first reason, I, I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical over the near and long term that people are interested in working all day using wearables, wearable, visual wearable mm -hmm. hardware. So, I mean, what you're wearing right now, you know, just an earpiece, I think is probably the limit of what people want to do all day, every day. Of course, there are call centers and, you know, places where people, sure. you know, will do it. But um, 
But in terms of like visual augmented or virtual reality where you, you require headsets, it, I just do, I do not personally believe that people want to work with that kind of hardware on all the time. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. The second thing is that hardware is expensive and it requires you know, significant amounts of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So therefore, any sort of long-term work solution that does require new hardware, uh, especially like visual augmented, visually augmented, you know, realities or virtual realities that require the hardware are not going to be, um, you know, equally accessible, or we could say inclusive um, across the whole workforce. So, you know, yeah, wealthy tech companies can afford to buy that kind of hardware for their employees, mm -hmm. but is that going to become like a mainstream part of people's work across the, the, the entire workforce of the United States? Like it's hard to see when the hardware, not only is it uncomfortable to wear, but also for long periods of time, but also it's, it's, it's expensive. And uh, I think those two things uh, alone are gonna, are gonna really decrease adoption for anything other than holiday parties, novelty, maybe, you know, I can see people trying things like that and do, <laughs> using it for, you know, orientations possibly and things like that. But just as a as a as an open ended commitment to the way a job is done, mm. it's, it's just very, very hard to believe that it's going to be adopted wide scale anytime soon. That's mm. the second set of reasons have to do with the aesthetics. Mm. I mean, of the of the of what's being presented. I mean, you know, 3D is neat. And um, you know, there are movies that are coming out in 3D and, you know, in the gaming world, it's obviously, you know, quite advanced. But do we really think that people want to work all day interacting with, you know, holograms and rendered, you know, fake bodies <laughs> of, of their, of their, uh, of their colleagues and, and vendors and customers? Like, again, it just seems like it's interesting as a novelty, but it doesn't seem like it's mm. in the mainstream demand uh, for what people want to do all day, every day. Okay, fair enough. I see what you're coming from. Now, you're in the space, you're looking at new tools that are being offered. At the same time, we're facing this return to work drive by many, many leaders, which you know, can potentially lead to a lot of these tools not being used. Yeah. And the question that I'm want to ask you is what are you seeing and thinking about the return to office debate yeah. Yeah. is it going to be the case that you know i was looking at the latest numbers maybe the occupancy rate is in 10 major cities is the latest i saw is around 49 percent or something like that mm -hmm. and so i'm curious what your forecast is to be for let's say a year from now Will people yeah. be working in the office more? Will people be working in the office less? Will people be working in the office the same, given that there's increasing availability of new tools like yours and other mm -hmm. folks who are offering more abilities to work remotely in a flexible way? Yeah. Well, I wish I knew <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but um, I do have some, I do have some thoughts. Um, they might add up to something of a prediction. I mean. What is absolutely clear is that we are not going back to 2019. Sure. You know, people people want more flexibility, and it's not just millennials and younger employees that want more flexibility. It's it's every employee. They want more flexibility uh, in their location and in their schedule. Now, uh, does that mean that they're guaranteed to quit if they don't get X? or why in a certain category? No. I mean, it's going to depend on the person. It's going to depend on the, 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 um, the company. It's going to depend on the industry. And of course, at a macro level, it's going to depend on the economy and you know whether or not we're already in a recession or we're, we're entering a recession and how long it will last. I mean, you know, the labor market's going to be responsive to all of this. But at the very core of of the of the expectation is this two and a half year period where we all learned quite a lot about what needs to happen in person and cannot mm. happen otherwise and what is possible when people are not physically together i believe that the the c suite in america 
when they say that people need to come back to work, they're not, uh, they're not ignoring the demand that people have for this flexibility. I think what they're doing is they are making a, a somewhat frustrated calculation that the tool sets that currently exist, like, uh, you know, like what we're using now, where it's just a video box next to another video box, just do not deliver the richness of in-person collaboration uh, that an office would deliver. So when a, when a CEO says that they want to lean into people coming back to work, part of it might be their existing real estate expenses. You know, they don't want that to go to waste. Part of it might be that, um, you know, that they don't like their home life or that they, you know, uh, you know, more cynical reasons that people have, you know, have speculated about or shared. But I think that mostly it's because they know that an office provides a platform for many different kinds of interactions, both scheduled and unscheduled, mm -hmm. and that there hasn't been up until now, uh, and for many of them, they're not aware of any kind of virtual, uh, you know, remote work experience that offers that same rich textured set of interactions that the in-person experience does. So that's what we're trying to, to do is put, put an option on the table that's a lot more like physical working to, physically working together than it is a video box next to a video box. It has a lot of the you know, familiar features of video software, but it supports a much wider um, you know, spectrum of interactions. And I think that once corporate America and once these CEOs come to understand that, that they are right to expect more out of their tools, then we'll, we'll see more activity across the board and then we'll see more options. And then people, uh, the people who are making the decisions will be more comfortable saying, you know what, uh, you know, we can have more flexibility here. But just like when electric cars came out, you know, one type of electric car is not suitable for everyone, sure. but you, you need a spectrum of options to get people excited at scale. So I think that, you know, we're entering a phase where the demand is staying, COVID and the, the COVID, uh, you know, the reasons that related to COVID for this big experiment are starting to recede or are mm -hmm. receding, um, but the demand remains. And now that the demand remains, the, you know, the workforce is, is going to be able to, to, uh, to expect that the software industry is going to come up with better, better alternatives um, than what we've been using for the last couple of years. And, and hopefully we're going to be a part of that, um, of that set of possibilities for them. Excellent. I think that's a great note on which to wrap up. But before we finish, is there anything else you want to share about hybrid work, remote work that we haven't yet touched upon? Um, well, we haven't talked about you know, work culture, because, you know, work culture is, is something that it's often spoken of separately from, from tools, but I believe they're very closely connected. Mm. Uh, I believe that um, it's worth mentioning, or it's worth, it's worth sharing with your, with your readers and, and um, the, the folks watching that, like, you know, highly, highly, uh, competitive and highly high achieving teams in government, in, non, non, in the nonprofit world, in sports, in for-profit, in the university space, uh, across every sector, they all have this commitment to be helpful to one another. Mm -hmm. Being helpful to your teammates is, is critical and an explicit commitment to being helpful to your, to your teammates and colleagues is one of the things that distinguishes high performers. Mm -hmm. So, in order to be helpful, you, you need to be present or visible. It's a, it's a lot harder to trust that someone's going to be there to help you if you cannot see them, and if the only way you can interact with them is by scheduling. So the point I'm trying to make is that for companies that are interested in building, in committing to, and in supporting an existing culture of being helpful to one another, they are the ones that have to demand, uh, you know, better, better tools because, because 
living a remote work life through a calendar with a with a set of meeting links does not inspire you know, uh, does not inspire an employee to believe that, you know, my teammates are, are around to help mm. me if I need it. And I think that's very important. So they are actually quite closely connected. The culture of helpfulness and the culture of, uh, of teamwork and the, the visual element of, of your daily workflow. And that's one of the most urgent reasons why, you know, people should want better tools. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Adam. This was a great interview. And thank you very much to the listeners and watchers of the show. Again, my name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski, and this has been another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, which is sponsored by Disaster Avoidance Experts. The, and I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of our consultancy. Make sure to subscribe to this show and review it on whatever channel you saw it on, on Amazon, on iTunes, wherever you check this out. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.